I should, um, I'm unprepared, I'm sorry. I should have a clipboard <clears throat> where, where we can send it around for those of you that may want to be up on our mailing list can sign up. I generally have that, and I just don't have it this time. Um, if you write your name and address down very clearly, please, sometimes clarity in the addresses we get is rough to, to read. Um, we can put you on that mailing list and just hand it off to me before we part ways. Uh, I've had some questions here, and that's why I'm, why I'm starting at this point, about the materials available for, I don't know, roughly 10 years, maybe a little bit more than 10 years, we've been putting out a, a monthly presentation on prophecy, and they're usually series. I'm, I'm not much one for doing a single sermon. It's usually you know, sometimes five, eight, ten presentations in one subject. And there's probably 120 hours worth of material, of materials available. Uh, so when someone asks me about, you know, what, where to start, where I point them is a 40-hour prophecy school that we did in 2004, I believe. And uh, that covers the basics. It's not everything, but it covers the basics, and it's on DVD, and I recommend it on DVD because we do a lot of visuals on the chart that are worthwhile. Um, I'm not trying to sell anything. There's some presentations that we do that you can get on an audio CD or a, a cassette tape. There isn't any visuals involved, and that would be fine. But on the, the Prophecy School, the visuals seem important to me. Um, do you have those, Glenn? Those are available when the sun goes down and tomorrow. Um, that, was, that Prophecy School took place before we were understanding the 2520. So the Idaho and Blythe, two different series, DVDs, uh, is where we deal with the 1843 chart, the 2520. There's several presentations there on the daily and some other related subjects. I would recommend those as well. There's a book that I would recommend called The Final Rise and Fall of the King of the North that we cover the last six verses of Daniel 11. And there's a magazine where we cover the last six verses of Daniel 11 called The Time of the End. I know that that's the same subject. It is a little bit redundant, but um, I think it's worth reading both of them because the magazine was written differently. Um, and then there's the book by Gerhard Damsteed called The Foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission, which is the, the textbook at his course in Andrews where he teaches Millerite history. And brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't know... Brother Damsteed at all, um, and I'm from the book. I can't. I do not understand. I do not come away from the book thinking that he understands or believes. But he may that the Millerite time period is is repeated. But still, it's the best book on that history, and and that history is repeated. So it's a good source book. And let me give you an example of it. It's. I have a couple of amazing examples to try to push that book a little bit. Um, if you remember Ellen White's vision of the Earth Made New, where she's seen Brother Stockman and Fitch. Remember that vision? And Brother Fitch died before 1844. He was one of the leading um, Millerite preachers. And he was disfellowshipped from his church family because he believed that the Bible um, called for and provided victory over sin. And as he was being disfellowshipped from his church in the Millerite time period, he wrote two very powerful letters to his church family defending his belief that we could have victory over sin right here and now. And in modern times, these two letters have been turned into books. Um, the first time it was printed, it was called Sin Shall Have No Dominion Over You. It has a different title now, but really good books. It's a, a defense on victory over sin without any spirit of prophecy because it was written long before. You know. Anyway, here's my point. In that time period, when Brother Fitch was getting disfellowship because he believed that he could, that we all could have victory over sin here and now, there was an argument in Christianity of the Millerite time period, <clears throat> and that argument is what got Brother Fitch disfellowshipped. And in the book that's going over the Millerite time period, Brother Dan Steed takes note of this argument in the religious world at that time, the argument being whether you could have victory over sin or whether you're going to continue to sin until Jesus returns. 
And in that time period of the Millerites, what do you suppose the Millerites that believed you could have victory over sin called the teaching that you were going to sin until Jesus returned? What was the label they put upon that teaching? New theology. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's points in that book that I'm not sure that, that Brother Dan Seed was, was making the connection with the end of the world, but uh, it, those are minor points. Some of the major points, of course, are what really transpired in fulfillment of prophecy. So that's, that's a book that we should all read. Um, and on the, in the newsletter, a couple times a year, we put a, a list of materials available so you can... You take that 40-hour prophecy school, and then you take the prophecy school that we just finished, the DVDs, um, in December of last year. Um, there was three speakers, a brother from, from Southern California, a brother from London, and myself, and I removed my presentations from that meeting because I was just so sick that I'm not going, I'm not going to publicly put those presentations out. I mean, I was beyond sick, the sickest I've been ever. And there's about, what, what is there, Glenn, maybe 20 hours in that school? <clears throat> and if you take the 40-hour prophecy school from 2004 and then the prophecy school that we just finished and the Blythe and the Idaho tapes, if you've, if you've digest those, you'll be well on your way to, to following the logic of what we're presenting in the other, the other presentations um, you won't have time to deal with immediately anyway. So if you would like to be on our mailing list, it has to be your burden to hand me your address before we all part ways. Um, okay, okay, that's resolved. Um, There is a there is much about the daily, as I've said, that that we're not addressing here. There's many points to deal with. Let, let's get back into our subject now, and if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to have one more prayer to get back into the the flow of things. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, once again as we continue this study, we invite your presence through your Holy Spirit and your angels to guide and direct not only the, the thoughts and the words that are conveyed, but um, please direct the minds that are hearing these things that, that they understand the logic and then that they understand their responsibility to test the things that they're, they're hearing according to your word, according to your will. We want to not be deceived and we know that you've warned us about deceivers and deceptions at this time of earth's history. Allow us um, to follow you into all truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in uh, Daniel 8, verse 11, <clears throat> the pioneers, when they address this verse, and, they, and the verse says, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. They're identifying this verse as pagan Rome, and you can go into the pioneer writings and see how they address this verse. But they identify that the place of the Roman sanctuary was the city of Rome where the Pantheon Temple existed. The Pantheon Temple is still a tourist attraction today. Um, if you go to the city of Rome, you can go in and visit the Pantheon Temple. Um, and brothers and sisters, it was, it was the temple of the gods. That's what pantheon means. All the different pagan deities were brought to this temple and worshipped there. And of course, this is where we get what? What word that impacts pantheism? Adventism? Pantheism. Uh, Kellogg. So the Adventists should have an understanding of the root word of pantheism. It goes back to this temple. Um, but the verse says, and the pioneers will point this out, that the place of his sanctuary, his sanctuary was in Rome. So Rome was cast down. And they point out that Rome was cast down in the year 330. And this truth, the, the casting down of Rome, is a subject of Bible prophecy, but we're not too familiar with it. In the handout that I gave you, and uh, I know that some of you didn't receive it because we ran out, if you get on the mailing list or you give me a note, with your name and address, I can get you a copy of that. Um, but in that 
um, handout. I, the, um, I just lost my train of thought, so I'll skip it. The, upon the testimony of two, I don't think that's where I was going. Let me, let me show you how the, the casting down of the sanctuary is, is located in different verses in, in Daniel and Revelation so that you see that the pioneer logic wasn't simply on the one verse, but it was consistent. If you turn, oh, that's, that's the quote I was looking for. In those notes, you'll see a quote where Sister White calls the book by Uriah Smith, God's Helping Hand. Now, one of the foundational presentations that I have, brothers and sisters, is the last six verses of Daniel 11, and I believe that the King of the North in the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the papal power for, for several different reasons. It can be proved from a variety of reasons. And Uriah Smith... In the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, when he gets to verse 36 of Daniel 11, he takes a wrong turn, and he says that the king of the north, from verse 36 onward, is Turkey. Okay, so, so what I'm saying to you is, even though I'm going to promote Uriah Smith's book right now, I want you to understand, there's things in his book that stand diametrically opposed to what I teach, but I still personally believe that it's the very finest presentation of the pioneer understanding of Daniel and Revelation that has, that's ever been written. You know, there's, there's some problems with it, but beyond those problems, what's in there um, is worth understanding. And he will point out the pioneer position on verse 24 of Daniel 11, and typically in Adventism, and I, I understand that some of you here, although I don't know all of you, some of you have probably been listening to some of the material that we put out over the years, so you may be familiar with what I'm going to say, but typically in Adventism, we're not familiar with what I'm about to say. There is a time prophecy on how long pagan Rome would rule the world in the Bible, and Uriah Smith deals with it in Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, and it's in verse 24 of Daniel 11. Verse 24 of Daniel 11 is speaking of pagan Rome. Virtually no one argues this in Adventism from any side of the arguments on prophecy that exist in Adventism. Verse 24 is dealing with, with pagan Rome. Very easy um, to see if you just walk down Daniel 11. In the previous verses, um, you can see the cross, and the context is pagan Rome. So in verse 24, it's saying, He, pagan Rome, shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and riches, Yea, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for, the, for a time. <clears throat> and Uriah Smith points out that this Hebrew word that's translated against is best translated as from. And you'll find sometimes when the word against is in the book of Daniel, that Hebrew word can be also understood as from, and it's better to understand it as from. And what it's saying is that pagan Rome would control the world from its stronghold, which was the city of Rome, for a time. And a time in Bible prophecy is a year. A year in the Bible is 360 days. And this verse is saying that pagan Rome would rule the world supremely for 360 years. And in Daniel 8, verse 9, if you turn there with me, I'll pull these things together. It says, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. The pioneers correctly understand that this little horn is going to represent both pagan and papal Rome as the little horn proceeds down through the verses 9 through 12. But in verse 9, it's primarily identifying the the earthly activities of pagan Rome. And pagan Rome was going to have to conquer three geographical areas, the east, the south, and the pleasant land. The east was Syria. The south was Egypt, the pleasant land was Israel. In Daniel 11, verses um, 15, start in verse um, 15 and 16. You can just read that. that. Those are parallel verses identifying these same three geographical areas that pagan Rome was going to have to conquer. Pagan Rome was going to have to conquer Syria, Israel, and Egypt before it ruled the world supremely. And the third of those three geographical areas that was conquered by Rome was Egypt, and it was conquered in 31 BC at perhaps the most famous naval battle in ancient history, the Battle of Actium. And at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, pagan Rome conquered Egypt, and according to verse 24, 
It would rule the world supremely then for 360 years, for a time. And in the year 330, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople. And the time period for pagan Rome to rule the world supremely came to an end. And from that point on, pagan Rome entered into the history where it would disintegrate into how many kingdoms? According to Daniel 7. Ten kingdoms. So the, the disintegration of pagan Rome begins here. But sure enough, in fulfillment of verse 24 of Daniel 11, pagan Rome ruled the world supremely for a time, for 360 years. But this time period ended when Constantine and the historians, this is one of the, the points in history, history where the historians are amazed. There was no political, economic, there was no reason for Constantine to move the capital. It was totally his personal whim. And when he moved so far away from the center of the empire, it began to crumble. So when it comes to Daniel 8.11, when it says the place of his sanctuary was cast down, the pioneers say that Constantine cast down the city of Rome, which is the place where the Pantheon Temple was in the year 330. This is a, this is a subject of Bible prophecy. I'll show you another place where this is a subject of Bible prophecy. Revelation 13, verse 2. <clears throat> And this, what I've told you here about the, the time prophecy and the Battle of Actium, it's all in Uriah Smith's book. This isn't anything that's originating with me. This is the pioneer understanding. Before we get to Revelation 13, 2, we're all familiar with Revelation 12. There's war with heaven, in heaven the, between the dragon and Christ. And in Great Controversy, Sister White says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Bible prophecy symbols can have primary and secondary and tertiary and on and on meanings. The primary meaning of the dragon in Revelation 12 and 13 is Satan, but the secondary meaning of the dragon in Revelation 12 and 13 is pagan Rome, the earthly power that Satan was using at that point in history. In Revelation 13 too, then, it's the same dragon of Revelation 12, it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as it were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him. Now the beast here, we understand, Sister White specifically says, this beast is the papacy. And this verse is saying that the dragon, the power before the papacy, pagan Rome, gives three things to the papacy. It's worth remembering, if this helps, that pagan Rome removed three things for the papacy, and it gave three things to the papacy. What were the three things that pagan Rome removed for the papacy? Daniel 7, the three horns, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals had to be removed for the papacy to take control of the world. But in that same history that they were removing three horns, they were giving three things to the papacy power, seat, and authority. And by and large, in Adventism, we don't have a very clear understanding of what the power and the seat and authority are any longer. But all the pioneers, they understood this. They dealt with it. If you go into the pioneer CD-ROM, you'll see it was a typical subject for the pioneers. The three things that pagan Rome gave to the, the papacy was the power meaning military power, economic power. It gave their strength to the papacy. And this is a historical... You can document this in history. The giving of the power of the papacy is a historical effect. The giving of the seat to the papacy is the year 330. In the year 330, when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople, he left a power vacuum in the city of Rome that the papal church just gobbled up, gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330, and it gave its authority to the papacy also. Now, all of these are historical events 
And brothers and sisters, you can show, we're not looking at this, we're not dealing with Revelation 13, but you can show that every one of these histories is repeated at the end of the world. They're in the process of repeating right now as we speak. The pagan, pagan Rome gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533, when the emperor Justinian identified the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. And that is definitely worth understanding, that history. That history is prefiguring when the ten kings of Revelation 17 agree to give their kingdom unto the papacy, because you can show that the ten kings represent the civil authority at the end of time. And when they give their civil authority to the papacy here at the end of the world, it's paralleling when Justinian gave the civil authority of the Roman Empire to the papacy in the year 533. Um, the power of pagan Rome was given to the papacy from the year 496 to 508. Now, this power was going to be exercised throughout the Dark Ages, but in the initial giving of the military and economic strength to the papacy from 496 to 508 is a very important history. In Daniel chapter 7, we all remember that pagan Rome, I hope we all remember, disintegrates into ten kingdoms, correct? But three of those horns, three of those kingdoms are going to have to be plucked up for the papal power to be placed in 538. In order for these three kingdoms, the Heruli, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, to be removed, the papacy has to come into control of some kind of army because the papacy doesn't have its own army. And this coming together of church and state began in 496. These seven European kings of Daniel 7 that are going to remove the three horns in order for them to come into a relationship with the papacy, where they will do the papacy's dirty work, they have to come in to a church-state relationship. And so this is a process that began in 496, when the king of France, Clovis, was in a war. This is you know, Catholic tradition. I don't know how much of this is true. He was in a battle. He was married to a Catholic wife. He thought he was going to lose that battle, and supposedly King Clovis cried out, O oh God of Clotilda, Clotilda was his wife, a Catholic. O oh God of Clotilda, if you will give me the battle, I will become a Catholic. And suddenly the battle turned, he prevailed, he became a Catholic, baptized his army, and, this is, and went to war for the papacy from this point on, came into a church-state relationship, and this event is why France, who Clovis was the king of, at that time called Gaul, uh, France is called the firstborn of the Catholic Church by the Catholic Church. It's called the eldest daughter of the Catholic Church because France was the first of the seven European kings to come into a church-state relationship with the papacy. Now, all seven of these European kings that were going to remove the three horns were going to have to come into this church-state relationship. And it took a period of time for this to take place, but there's something very important to take note of and this is the pioneer position on this subject, and it is backed up by the historians. That prior to all of these seven European kings becoming, coming into a church-state relationship with the papacy, they were all pagan countries, and it's a little bit more difficult for Americans to understand this, but even in the world today, most countries in the world have an official um, national religion. We don't have it here. So sometimes we don't realize that these, these seven European kings, when we say they were pagan nations, they weren't just pagan nations. It was the legal religion of their nations. And when they came into church-state relationship with the papacy, they changed the legal profession of paganism as the state religion from paganism to Catholicism. Historical fact, Clovis did this. And one by one... From 496 to the year 508, each of these seven European kings came into a church-state relationship with the papacy in order to do the work of removing the three horns. And as they did so, they changed the legal profession, religious profession of each of their nations from paganism 
to Catholicism. And this is why on this chart, the pioneers say that by the year 508, paganism had been taken away. It had been removed as the official religion of these seven European nations by that time period. That is the pioneer position. Now, let me show you one more thing. Um, so what I'm saying here, in, in concluding where we were ending up in our last presentation, when we're saying in, in Daniel 8, verse 11, yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself against Christ, the prince of the host, at his birth and at his death, and through pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was lifted up and exalted, and the place of his sanctuary, the Pantheon Temple, which was located in the city of Rome, the city of Rome was cast down. It was cast down by Constantine in the year 330, and when the pioneers make this conclusion, they're making this conclusion in connection with several other passages of prophecy. It's not just a singular verse where they're making this claim. This is Revelation 13.2. The dragon gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330. But um, when it comes to the subject of the daily in the book of Daniel, there is an argument that hasn't ever been addressed by the modern theologians. I'm just going to give it to you in a very brief form. Okay? There is a pattern of Christ. It's not the pattern of the nature of Christ. It's simply the pattern of the way marks of the time period that he was here on earth. Um, Sister White plainly tells us, and we know this, that Christ was 30 years old when he was baptized, all right? So in the history of Christ, the pattern of Christ, in terms of a prophetic pattern, not the nature of Christ, you have 30 years here that we call preparation. 30 years of preparation, and then Christ, at his baptism, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, all right? At the baptism, he's empowered And he gives his testimony for how long? Uh, not really. Seven years. You know, in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, it's very clear that he gave his testimony for seven years. Sister White says it this way. Christ gave his testimony for seven years, for the first three and a half years in person, and for the second three and a half years in, through the representation of his disciples. So that was a trick question. But he gives his testimony for three and a half years, and what happens to him at the end of the three and a half years? He's crucified. And then here he's resurrected. And then he ascends. Um, and this presentation, just this part of the presentation is like an hour long. We're going to do it in about five minutes here, so bear with me. This is a brief overview. And after his ascension, you can mark... 8070. And the reason that I mark 8070 is the destruction of Jerusalem, um, which is also a symbol of the end of the world. All right. And I, I want to put that into the history because in the year 8100, you have the second coming of Christ. Now, this is kind of an obscure quote. Um, so, usually. We're not familiar with this, so I probably need to read this one to you. But Sister White says, in the early days, um, Christ came a second time. Uh, let me find it rather than try to paraphrase it. But it was at the Isle of Patmos. Um, Sorry, I have the quote. Sister White identifies the year 100 in the sense that when Christ came to give the revelation to John, here it is, Manuscript Releases, Volume 19, page 40, 41. In the days of the early Christians, Christ came the second time. His first advent was at Bethlehem when he came as an infant. His second advent 
was at the Isle of Patmos when he revealed himself in glory to John the Revelator, who fell at his feet as dead when he saw him. So all I want you to see is the basic overview of this pattern so we can make one more point about the daily before we move off this subject, is that there is a pattern that is established in the time period of Christ that recurs um, several times in Scripture once you see the pattern. 30 years of preparation, then empowerment, and the testimony is given. In Christ, it was for three and a half years. Then death. The cross will put death. Followed by resurrection, ascension. Then uh, the fall of Babylon. The seven last plagues. Whatever you want to describe A.D. 70 as. The destruction of Jerusalem is a symbol of the end of the world and the chaos that takes place just prior to the return of Christ. And then at the Isle of Patmos, we have prophetically represented the second coming of Christ. So this is the pattern of Christ in his life. You can see this identical pattern in Revelation 11, which is also about Christ. Um, Revelation 11 is talking about the Old and the New Testament, which is the Word of God. And who is the Word of God? Christ. And in Revelation 11, the history of the Old and the New Testament that is set forth in Revelation 11 follows this identical pattern of Christ. And upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. You don't see the preparation time period, but you see the rest. So you can assume, prophetically assume, the first way mark. And this is traditional Adventist understanding. We understand this, that when you have a line of prophecy that has a certain amount of way marks, and we have another line of prophecy that has those same waymarks. If the second line of prophecy is missing one of the waymarks, it's automatically understood that the missing waymark is there. And you know this even if you've never thought about it. We teach in Adventism that the kingdoms of Bible prophecy are represented in Daniel 2, and they begin with Babylon. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy are repeated in Daniel 7, and they begin with Babylon. And the kingdoms of Bible prophecy are repeated in Daniel 8, and they begin with the Medes and Persians, but we automatically know that they begin with Babylon. Okay? So there is a preparation that is not identified in Revelation 11, but notice verse 3 where it starts. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, three score, a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now who is his two witnesses? It's the Old and New Testament, it's the Bible, it's the Word of God. They are empowered, and then they're going to give their testimony for how long? Three and a half prophetic years. All right, so it's, it's, this pattern is beginning. Um, now notice verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them, and what? Kill them. Death. All right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, verse 11, And after three, and a half day, three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. They were resurrected. And great fear fell upon them which saw them, and, then, and they heard a voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended into heaven upon a cloud. You see how... The Old and New Testament, which is a type of Christ, is a fo following the identical pattern. Do you see this? This is easy to see, right? Okay. Verse 13, And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain, and in the earthquake quake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, the pioneer understanding on this is it's just sound. A, a city in Bible prophecy, if you take your concordance, is a kingdom. And this is talking about a kingdom that has an earthquake and one of one tenth of the city fell. And the pioneers understand that this kingdom is the kingdom of pagan Rome that disintegrated into ten kingdoms. And there was to be an earthquake that brought down one of those kingdoms and that the earthquake that brought down one of those kingdoms was the French Revolution that brought down France. That's their take on Revelation 13. So... Right there in the sequence, suddenly you have the French Revolution, and just as Sister Wright identifies the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 as symbolically represent, representing the end of the world, she also identifies the French Revolution 
as a symbol of the very same event. So it's the same pattern. And then in verse 14 it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And brothers and sisters, <clears throat> the pioneers understood that the third woe was the, the cataclysmic crisis that brought us to the second coming of Christ. And we need to understand what the third woe is today because the third woe is underway and it is present truth. But in any case, not dealing with the third woe right now, just dealing with this. In the life of Christ, there was a pattern. 30 years of preparation, then he's empowered to give his testimony for three and a half years, after which he died, then he was resurrected, then he ascended, then there is a symbolic representation of the end of the world, and then the second coming of Christ. And in a second line of prophecy in Revelation 11, which is a type of Christ, you have the empowerment, the testimony for three and a half years, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the fall of Babylon, seven last plagues, and the second coming of Christ. Do you see it? It's easy to see, right? Simple, and it's not stretching anything. So, there is a truth connected with the taking away of the daily, in 508, that the pioneers did not understand it and did not identify it anyway, that is an argument that hasn't been even dealt with by the modern theologians that suggest that the daily represents Christ's sanctuary ministry. And it is this, that the papal power is the Antichrist's power. And the Antichrist, today, we, when we hear the word anti, we think of something that's opposed to and Antichrist, it does have that meaning as well. But the primary meaning of Antichrist is in place of. The Antichrist is the power that tries to take the place of Christ, the papacy. And it is governed by the same pattern that Christ went through because it is a counterfeit to Christ. And when you maintain the pioneer position on Daniel 12.11, and let's, let's read that. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. The pioneers understood that the daily represented paganism and they believed that the seven European kings by the year 508, when the seventh and final of those seven European kings, which was the king of England and his name was Arthur, converted to Catholicism and removed the legal profession of paganism from his kingdom and replaced it with Catholicism. From the time that the daily was removed in 508, there would be 1,290 years. And in order to keep with the, with the structure of this, I didn't think that through. There would be 1,290 years. It brings you to 1798. Now the verse is talking about, when it talks about from the time that the daily is removed in 508, if you maintain the pioneer position, the next phrase is talking about in order to set up the papacy, in order to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. There was a 30-year period of preparation from 508 to 538 that had to take place before the papacy was empowered. And please notice that from 508 to 538, you have 30 years. How many years was Christ in preparation before he was empowered? 30 years. And then when Christ was empowered at his baptism, he gave his testimony for how long? Three and a half years. When the papacy was empowered in 538, how long did it give its testimony? Three and a half prophetic years. All right, do you see that? I can't put 0.5, that wouldn't be good. The papacy then, in 1798, what happened? He received its deadly wound. At the end of the world, where we're at today, we are seeing the resurrection of the papal power. And when it is resurrected, Bible prophecy 
teaches that it will ascend to the throne of the earth. And if you look at the word ascend in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, you'll see that this is one of the characteristics of the papacy. Sister White has a statement I'm sure you're familiar with where she says the Protestants of the United States are working to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin. One of the characteristics of the papacy is that he's destined to ascend once again to the throne of the earth. He's resurrected, he's brought back to life by the Protestants. Then he's placed upon the throne of the earth. And then Babylon falls for real. And then Jesus comes. The papacy, the history of the papacy is governed by the pattern of Christ because they are the Antichrist. There are other histories in the Bible that are governed by this pattern. But what I want you to see here, what I want you to consider is that when the pioneers identify that paganism was removed in 508, they were, they were selecting a date based upon historical fact that makes a connection, a prophetic connection that they did not recognize and that if you're going to understand that the daily is Christ's sanctuary ministry, then you have to, you have to respond to this argument as well. And, and it hasn't been done. And then it goes on to say, just because we're in Daniel 12, it says, blessed is he who comes to the 1335, which brings you to um, 1843, according to the pioneers. Um, and in 1843... Now remember, when it comes to 508 to 1843 here, I'm getting out of the pattern of Christ. Now I'm just talking about the two time prophecies in Daniel 12. When it comes to the 1335 time prophecy that the pioneers put up on this chart and understood, it begins in 508 and it is not impacted by the year zero because it starts 500 years after the year zero. So when they conclude 1843 as the conclusion of the 1335, their math is correct. And the verse says in Daniel 12, 12, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days, which is 1843. And what is the blessing of 1843? The blessing of 1843 you can find in Revelation where it says, blessed is he who is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In 1843, <laughs> the parable of the ten virgins was being fulfilled in the Millerite movement, and they were those that were being called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they were prepared. Now, brothers and sisters, this is, this is a, sometimes a little bit hard to follow the first time through, but October 22nd, 1844, was the test for the Millerites. They had several tests leading to that, but the, the, the test where... The separation was full and complete was October 22, 1844. That was the crisis of that history. And Sister White teaches that character is never developed in a crisis. It's only demonstrated. And your character is prepared before the crisis by the Holy Spirit. And in 1843, the Lord had prepared men and women for the, the crisis of the midnight cry and the closing of the door on October 22, 1844. The blessing of coming to 1843 was that you had been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You'd reached the point in time where, if faithful, you could enter into the most holy place with Christ. And we read in an earlier presentation quotes where Sister White said, Blessed are the eyes that saw the things that transpired in 1843 and 1844. Um, there, that was the blessing there. The pioneer understanding of the 1290 and the 1335 is sound. And here today in Adventism, we have many voices that take these time prophecies and place them at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion. And I do not believe that they understand that when they do that, they are destroying the foundations of Adventism. Um, so, we have we've touched a little bit on the 2520. We've touched a little bit on the daily. Only to get to where we want to start dealing with the message of this weekend. The message of this weekend, from this point on, is going to be upon these horses here. And these horses are representing <clears throat> the fifth and the sixth trumpet. The understanding, the pioneer understanding of the trumpets is largely unknown in Adventism today. If you want to see the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, simply break open that book by Uriah Smith. 
Um, what I'm going to tell you about the history of the, the seven trumpets in Revelation is it's going to be right in tune with what Uriah Smith teaches, but without maintaining that pioneer understanding, which I submit is the foundational understanding if we don't understand the first six trumpets of Revelation as the pioneers understood them, I don't see how it's humanly possible to correctly understand the seventh trumpet. And the seventh trumpet is the trumpet that began to blow on October 22, 1844, and includes the third woe. And the third woe is the crisis that brings about not only the Sunday law, but the closing of human probation and when you maintain the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, brothers and sisters, you understand that the third woe began six years ago. Six years ago. So, the trumpets of Revelation as the pioneers understood them has been, it's been under attack in a variety of ways. Um, throughout history. Um, for instance, uh, uh, the passage in Great Controversy where Sister White speaks about Josiah Litch's prediction. I know that we're, we're all familiar with that passage where um, Josiah Litch printed an article predicting the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1840 and no one accepted his Understanding, but when it came to pass, suddenly the world recognized that the year day principle of that the Millerites was using was correct, and therefore what they were predicting about 1843 and later 1844 was valid. And it was from that point on that power came into the message. And in that passage in Great Controversy, which I'm looking for as we speak, um, if you haven't looked at this subject closely, you, you may not realize that there's sects of Adventism that believe crazy things about that passage in Great Controversy. Some people actually teach and they print tracts that say those two paragraphs in the Great, Great Controversy where Sister White says this, Great Controversy 334. Let's put this into the record. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition on Reve of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown, and on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of the prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840, to 1844, the work rapidly extended. There are Adventists that teach that Uriah Smith s secretly snuck those two paragraphs into the Great Controversy. Did you know that? There are Adventists in Europe last year, uh, in Austria, a theologian that had taught in an Adventist university over there and has recently been kicked out of teaching because of some of his absurd ideas. Um, he came to that camp meeting to try to straighten my understanding out on some prophetic truths, and, and he was convinced that when Sister White says the event exactly fulfilled the prediction, that all Sister White is saying is that what Josiah Litch came to pass. Josiah Litch humanly made a prediction, and it came to pass, and it had power to the movement, but she's not really saying that this was the fulfillment of prophecy. And by the context of the passage, there's no way you can say that. The point is, is that when you begin to look at the subject of the trumpets, because when Josiah Litch is making this prediction here, this is the sixth trumpet. When it comes to the subject of the trumpets in Adventism, until you begin to investigate them, you do not realize what a warfare has been carried out by Satan on this particular prophetic subject. It's, it, there, there's been attempts to undermine 
this understanding from a variety of ways. I submit to you that one of the reasons that you and I are not so pro thoughts on the Daniel and Revelation of Uriah Smith is because of his upholding this position. Because this position, this position about what took place in 1840, we need to know. Because, brothers and sisters, on August 11th, 1840, not only did the Ottoman Empire collapse in fulfillment of the time prophecy of Revelation 9.15, but at the same time, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down. And at the same time, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. This particular point of history is one of the most significant waymarks in the Millerite time period, and it's a waymark that has purposely been attempted by Satan to be obscured or destroyed because it is prefiguring an event at the end of the world that you and I are required to understand correctly. We're required to understand correctly. Let me tell you why I'm saying that, because we're almost done. And I'll at least put this in your, your mind, and we will start developing the point. The latter rain, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, I do not believe, understand that we must recognize when the latter rain is falling. Amen. When the latter rain begins to fall, there will be two groups in Adventism, one group that recognizes that it's falling and one that doesn't. And those that don't recognize it they're about to be sifted out of Adventism. Let me read you some quotes. Testimonies to Ministers, page 507. And the reason I'm saying this is the event that has been prefigured by August 11th, 1840 is the event that marks the point when the latter rain begins to sprinkle. And because of this, Satan understood this, because of this, he has attempted to undermine a correct understanding of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the sixth trumpet. That's the logic I'm suggesting over the next, today and tomorrow, we will try to demonstrate that that logic is sound. But notice Testimonies to Ministers, page 507. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Brothers and sisters, there comes a time period in Adventism when the latter rain is falling. And some of us aren't going to recognize it or receive it, while others are going to receive it, which means that they recognize it. We have to recognize it. Notice this one. This is Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 984. We must not wait for the latter rain. It is coming upon all who will recognize and appropriate the dew and showers of grace that fall upon us. Testimonies to Ministers, page 300. And, and this is one of the passages where she's talking about a church or a town or a state or a country, but they just they block it out. You don't know who she's talking about unless you went to the Ellen White State. Just got a line there. It says, unless those who can help in Newport, Washington, who put that in here? Pardon me? Diamond Lake. Diamond Lake. How about uh, northeastern Washington? Unless those who can help in northeastern Washington are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel's message shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. 
Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins into his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. From this point on, we're going to try to develop for you in a clear fashion that by retaining the pioneer understanding of the trumpets as illustrated upon the 1843 pioneer chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered, that you will have the foundational understanding necessary to identify that the latter rain has begun to fall and that we are required to recognize this for to not recognize this places us among the group that does not discern or receive the latter rain. And I'm serious about this. The evidence is there. Now take a look around. Take a look around in the room. Just If you're in front, look back. I want to make a point here. From my experience, when it comes to tomorrow on Sunday, there won't be that many people here. But if what I'm suggesting is true, is this something that everyone in this room needs to understand? Now, if it's false, you have the responsibility to expose it as error and raise your voice against it. So you have a double responsibility. You have a responsibility to determine if it is a message for yourself that you need to incorporate into your experience. And you have a responsibility to protect the flock from heresy and false teaching. But Bible prophecy says at the end of the world that God's people are asleep. They're Laodiceans. They're a valley of dead, dry bones, according to Ezekiel 37. Sister White says our greatest need is for a revival. And sure enough, and I don't want this, and I'm not a prophet, so I can't be sure my prediction is true, but sure enough, tomorrow the numbers are going to be lessened, and tomorrow we'll start tonight. I hope you've listened to the presentation tonight, where we will nail down 9-11 with one nail, but there's about nine prophetic nails to nail it down with. But brothers and sisters, the latter rain's falling. The Lord is unsealing the message of the hour that brings about the experience that purifies the 144,000 and prepares them to give the loud cry message to a world that knows that the end is coming, but they don't understand. They don't understand. And we are the people that have been called and chosen to bring clarity into this time period, and we need to understand these things. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been together here for this Sabbath day and been blessed by your presence. I know that, as always, I move through material very quickly. I ask that your Holy Spirit would help in that regard for those that are hearing some of these things for the first time, that they can be challenged with what we're suggesting that they can be motivated to test what we're sharing. And Lord, we want to be among those that are raised up at this final hour to give the the loud cry message to the world, but we know that there's a striving that has to take place among us. Sister White has told us we have to strive to be among the 144,000. Help us to turn our affections away from the worldly things. Help us understand the areas in our lives that need to be put on the altar and surrendered to you. Give us the courage to enter into this experience. We want to be tools in your hands. We want to reach out to our families, our family members that aren't prepared. 
to our neighbors that know nothing of these things. We want to be soul winners for your kingdoms. We have to be saved ourselves first, and we have to understand the message of the hour, and we ask that you would make this happen in our lives. We ask that this, this time period, this weekend here, will be a point that we can look back in each of our individual sacred histories as a time where you empowered us to carry out this work for ourselves and this work for others. In Jesus' name, amen.